Yeah, and all God's people said, well, good morning, Trinity Church family. A special welcome to those of you who might be joining us for the first time as we are continuing on in our series through the book of Romans. Uh, Just to review briefly for those uh, who might be joining us for the first time, Paul, the Apostle Paul, the author of this letter that we've been looking at, Paul has been for four chapters, if you've been around for this series, he's been for four chapters explaining the gospel. But in Romans 5, which is what we're going to get into today, uh, Paul will go from explaining the gospel to celebrating the gospel. He's going to go from explaining the gospel to celebrating the gospel, highlighting the many benefits of the gospel, which are ours through faith in Christ. So if you've got a Bible, we're going to jump right in, beginning in verse 1. It begins this way, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith... Now, actually, I want to back up. Therefore, this is a really key transitional word in this letter. Uh, Before we get into the benefits of the gospel, I want to kind of drill down on this first word, therefore, because whenever you see a therefore, you need to ask the question, what is it? Therefore, right? The English 101. I know some of you would be really excited about this, and others of you are like, I hope this is going somewhere. One of the things you've got to understand about the book of Romans, remember, it's Paul making this case like an attorney would as to why we need the gospel. That's what he's been doing the last few chapters, and now he's going to be celebrating the gospel. So this therefore, it's therefore because it's a transition word that's letting us know that what we are about to read logically follows what has come before. And what has come before Romans 5 is Paul's four-chapter explanation of the gospel, how it is that we are justified by God through faith in Christ, that we're justified. We even sang it in one of our songs. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. It's how we uh, attain this righteous standing with God, not by our own merits, by what Christ has done for us. So for four chapters, Paul's been explaining how it is that we are justified by God through faith in Christ, the results of which are some very significant benefits. The first of which is peace with God. If you're following along in your notes, peace with God. Here it is. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to explain peace here because the peace that Paul is talking about here in Romans 5 verse 1 is not a feeling of calm. It's not warm fuzzies. Uh, It's not what some people have referred to as spiritual shivers. Really, it has nothing to do with feelings. And I point this out because many folks today think that that is the purpose of religion, to feel peaceful, which is why people today will often say this. Maybe you've had conversations with folks. Maybe sometimes you've even thought this. Uh, They'll say something like this. uh, That's great that Jesus gives you a feeling of peace. That's great that Jesus gives you a feeling of peace. But I get that feeling of peace when I'm hiking or when I'm hunting or when I'm reading, or when I'm doing yoga, or when I'm sipping a latte, right? That's great that Jesus gives you that feeling of peace, but I get that feeling of peace other ways. Here's the important thing to note right out of the gate. Paul is not talking about feeling peace. What he's talking about here is having peace, specifically having peace with God. Paul here is talking about a change in our relationship status with God. That because of being justified through faith in Christ, his work on the cross, we are now at peace with God. Not peace from God, peace with God. By the way, the implications of this are huge. This implies that prior to our being justified through faith in the work of Christ on the cross, we were actually at war with God. We were at war with God. We we were enemies of God. Which is, by the way, exactly what Paul says we were in verse 10 until we believe the gospel. Paul says in verse 10, we'll jump down and then we'll come on back, but back in, uh, in verse 10, Paul says it uh, this way, that we were God's enemies until we were reconciled, reconciled to God through the death of his son. In other words, prior to the gospel, our relationship status with God was enemy of God. We were at war with God. Now, I know this idea that prior to Christ that we were at war with God seems over the top to a lot of people today, even some people in the church. But but here's the reality. When we do life our way, when we do life our way instead of God's way, we are, in essence, claiming kingship over our lives. That's what we're doing. We're claiming kingship over our lives. It's not just that we disobeyed some of God's commandments. I'm not saying it doesn't include that. I'm saying it's not as simple as just we were disobeying some of God's commandments. 
What we are in essence doing is we are claiming kingship over our lives. And the problem is this. God also claims kingship over our lives. And whenever two parties claim kingship over something, what is going to happen? Well, a war is going to happen. A war is going to happen. Let me speak to this autobiographically. When I lived my life like I was in charge, when I resisted God's authority, when I determined for myself what was good for me, when I did what Romans 1 talks about, deciding for myself what is good, what will fulfill me, when I was living that way, I was in essence at war with God. A war that would ultimately lead to my death, as God forewarns, all the way back at the beginning of Genesis. I'm at war with God, and I'm at war with God such that it will lead to my ultimate death. Because God doesn't lose. But through Christ's mediation on the cross, this is the gospel, through Christ's mediation on the cross, this is what we were just singing about. Through Christ's mediation on the cross, my treason is now forgiven. Yes, it's sin, but I want to use that word because it's really important to understand God is king. My treason is forgiven, and I'm no longer considered God's enemy. I am now, as Paul says here, at peace with God. Therefore, Paul says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Again, Paul here is not talking about subjective feelings. He's talking about an objective change in our relationship with God. That because of justification, we now have peace with God. Now I say all of that, and I want to follow it with this. That doesn't mean our feelings don't matter. Our feelings matter. It's just that far more important than feeling peace is knowing that I have peace with God. See, I can feel okay and not be okay. Are you with me? And vice versa, I cannot feel okay and actually be okay. J.D. Greer explains it this way. He says, which would you prefer, to go to the doctor feeling fine, only to have the doctor say you have a brain tumor, or to go to the doctor feeling a headache, but after running some tests, have the doctor come back and say, you're fine, your headache is nothing serious. My point is simply this. Our feelings don't always tell us the truth about where we are with God. Our feelings don't always tell us the truth about our relationship status with God. And I make this point because of this. I can't tell you how many conversations that I've had as a pastor over the years with believers who have said something like this to me. I don't even know anymore if God loves me. I'm not even sure anymore if I'm saved because I don't feel God anymore like I used to. I've had that conversation a lot over the decades of pastoral ministry. I don't even know if God loves me anymore because I don't feel him like I used to. Maybe you can relate to that. If that's you, Paul would say this, I think. Don't let your feelings tell you what to believe about God. Tell your feelings to listen to Romans 5.1 if you want to know where you really stand with God. See, Paul wants those of us who have put our our trust in in Christ as Savior and Lord, he wants us to know that we have peace with God. And he wants us to know this for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons he wants us to know this is because our knowing that we have peace with God will actually, in greater degrees, ultimately lead to us feeling peace from God. But we got to get that order. If we chase peace from God... We may miss out on both peace from God and peace with God, most importantly. you gotta get, you got to get the engine in front of the caboose. It's peace with God first, and then peace from God that follows. By the way, this is the testimony of my daughter, Glory. I, I shared this a few weeks ago, that when Glory was a little girl, she, she struggled to know and feel God's peace. She thought if she could be the perfect little girl, that she could earn God's acceptance, which only caused her to get knotted up with anxiety. I didn't realize this at the time, but years later, Glory told me how she would make these vows before bedtime that when she woke up the next day, she would live perfectly before God and perfectly for God. And then when she fell short of that perfect standard, as we all do, she would get discouraged. But for a couple years, she would just redouble her efforts and try harder until she eventually began to despair. 
as she came face to face with the impossibility of living a sinless life. Well, when I finally realized what was going on with Glory, I decided that on our next daddy-daughter date, we would get some hot chocolate. We would look together at Romans 5.1 that says this, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory was so longing for peace. She was hungry for peace. She was pursuing peace. And so I explained to Glory that peace with God is not something that we can earn by being good enough for God to accept us. No, peace, Paul says, comes through faith in what God did to make us acceptable. And as I sat across the table from my daughter, I, I, I realized there was this light bulb moment that was going on in her heart as the word of God was breaking the spell of moralism over her. As Romans 5.1 was opening her heart to the reality of God's peace. And it was helping her to rest in the fact that because of Christ, what he's done for her, as she puts her trust in him, she was coming to this realization that there's nothing that she can do to make God love her more, and there's nothing she can do to make God love her less. Which is what leads to real, ultimate, lasting peace. Now, my guess is that there are some here today who would also love to have this assurance. If you were honest, you would be like, I don't know if I'm actually living in that place of assurance. Friend, I just want to say this morning, you can when you put your faith in what Jesus did to give you peace with God. That's the first and most important benefit of the gospel that I want you to understand. It's peace with God. Another benefit of the gospel, if you're following along in your notes, is that we now have access to grace. Look at verse 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We have this access to God's grace. Uh, in the original Greek, this phrase, we have gained access, uh, it actually carries with it this idea of being introduced to a powerful king or to be brought into the presence of an influential dignitary. Well, in this case, the powerful king is God himself, the king of kings, right? And again, this access to God is ours as a result of our justification through faith in Christ. All of this flows from the therefore. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. The idea here is that you and I, prior to justification, did not have access to God because we did not have the credentials. We did not have the resume. We did not have the connections to just waltz into the throne room of God. But in Christ, Paul says, we now have the credentials. We now have the resume, Christ's resume. We now have the connection, Christ himself, who now gives us access into the very presence of God. So that now we don't need to make a reservation to hopefully get on God's calendar. We don't have to hope that we can have a conversation with God if what we want to talk to God about is important enough to be worthy of his time. We don't have to be a super Christian who's lived a sinless life or been good for however so you know, many days or weeks you think you have to be in order to go back into God's presence. None of that. We don't have to fret about whether we've been good enough lately to be considered worthy of his time. No, in Christ, Paul is saying, we now have access to meet with the King of Kings. And we have access to meet with the King of Kings 24-7, 365 days a year. 366 days if it's a leap year. We have access to meet with the King of Kings because of Christ. Uh, I've got a, an analogy. It's, a, it's an imperfect analogy, but it just keeps coming to my mind, and so I'm going to share it. So give me a little bit of grace as it's an imperfect analogy. Uh, at a previous church where I served, the offices were configured in such a way that you couldn't get into the lead pastor's office without walking through the administrative assistant's office. I didn't really love that setup, uh, but in a big church, the idea was that there needed to be some sort of a check-in where people who wanted to meet with the lead pastor would first make an appointment with my admin, with Deborah. But do you know who never had to make an appointment? Do you know who could just walk right through her office, right into my office, without first checking in? My kids. My kids. And Deborah knew it. 
Deborah knew that my kids had access to me anytime they wanted. They didn't need to first check in. They didn't need to make an appointment. They were free to walk right through her office, right into my office whenever they wanted to. Why? Because they're my kids. Because they're my kids. And again, I know the analogy breaks down mostly around the fact that I'm not God and all God's people said, <laughs> amen, there it is. That was like the most hearty amen I've heard in a while. Okay, that's all right, but that's true. The analogy breaks down, but, but here's the point of my sharing the story. Uh, I, I think this is kind of the point that Paul is making here in Romans 5 too, that through Christ, right, we are now God's kids who are loved by God, who now have access to God. A God who wants to see us. A God who wants to help us. A God who wants to give us the grace we need to live the life he's called us to live. And there's nothing now that we need besides Christ to obtain this access to God and his help. What a deal. What a deal. We have this access now into the very presence of the King of Kings through Christ. But let me ask you, Christian, is that your perspective? That God wants to see you, that God wants to meet with you, that God wants to help you, that his door is open to you 24-7. Is that your perspective? J.D. Greer asks it this way. He says, how do you think God feels about you right now? And how do you determine the answer to that question? Do you base it on what kind of week you've had? How consistent your quiet times have been? How good you've behaved? How much you've sinned? For years, J.D. says, qualifications like these drove my response. If I'd had a good week, I felt close to God. When Sunday came around, I felt like lifting my heads and hands in worship as if to say, God, here I am. I know you're excited to see me. But he said the opposite was also true. If I hadn't had a good week, if I felt distant from God, if I'd fallen into temptation or been a jerk to my wife or dodged opportunities to share Christ or was stingy with my money, on those weeks, I felt like God wanted nothing to do with me. And so when I came to church, I had no desire to meet with God because all I could feel was shame. And I was pretty sure God didn't want to see me either. But this is because, he says, I didn't really understand the gospel. I didn't really understand the gospel. Friends, the gospel is that God now sees Christ when he looks at me, even on my bad days. Let me say it this way, even on my worst days. God now sees Christ when he looks at me. And that is because Christ gives me his perfect record in exchange for my imperfect record, such that God now sees Christ when he looks at me. God now sees me every single day according to how Christ has lived, not according to the kind of week I've lived. In other words, the reason that we have access to God is because Christ's resume is now our resume. How many of you ever put together a resume for a job, right? Like you're like, oh, I've got to try to make myself sound and look good because I, I want to get through the door to the interview, right? Like you're, you're putting your resume together. Why? Because you're trying to get it to the front of the line. You're trying to get a hearing. You're trying to gain access to those who have influence and power. The reason that we have access to God is because Christ's resume is now our resume. Which is why, those of us who are in Christ, we can actually say this, God, here's my resume for coming into your presence. This week, I concluded a 40-day fast, during which time I went toe-to-toe with Satan and resisted all of his temptations. I also suffered unjustly at the hands of sinners, but I did so without any complaint or selfish retaliation. The only time I opened my mouth was to forgive those who were crucifying me. And not only that, but I walked on water, healed a blind man, and fed 5,000 hungry people with a couple of loaves of bread and a few fish. Now, I know some of you are like, that's not your resume. That's Jesus' resume. To which I would say, exactly. That's the gospel. That Jesus' resume is now my resume. Friends, the gospel is not just that Jesus' death paid for all my sins. It is that. Hallelujah. And that is glorious. But the gospel is more than that. The gospel is also that Jesus' perfect record and Jesus' resume is now my record and my resume. Which is why I can now boldly approach God. Because God now sees Christ when he looks at me. Or as Paul says it here in verse 2, through Christ, we now have access. 
to grace. Folks, how much more boldly, how much more regularly, how much more diligently would we approach God, even on our bad days, if we really believed that God now sees Christ's record and Christ's resume when he looks at me? That's the second gospel benefit. Access to God's grace. Next, Paul speaks of the hope of glory. This is the third benefit that I want to speak to this morning here in this passage. The hope of glory. Third benefit that is ours in the gospel. We boast in the hope of the glory of God, Paul says. Hope is actually mentioned three times in this paragraph. Take a look. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, Paul says, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I want to take a moment to unpack this gospel benefit called hope uh, because in English, This word hope has become a very flimsy word. Uh, We often use this word hope to mean something that we want to happen, but something that we are not banking on happening. As in, I hope the Seattle Mariners will get to the World Series at some point in my lifetime. But I am not banking on that happening. And so I wear this as a rep of my Seattle Mariners with a hope that they'll get to the World Series someday. But I'm not betting the farm on it. I hope, right? That's, we, we use we use word, the, the word hope in that kind of a context. Uh, in the Greek, though, this word hope is so much more than just mere wishful thinking. Biblical hope is grounded in certainty. Biblical hope is grounded in this conviction that God is both doing something in us and preparing something for us, even now in the midst of what Paul calls our pain and our suffering. Even as we're in this waiting space, Right? This is why Paul says that we rejoice in our suffering. Why? Because he says it produces in us perseverance, which is one of the characteristics of Christ, whose image God is shaping us to look more like. Now, a, a clarifier here. Uh, some people read this verse about rejoicing in our suffering, and they think that the Bible is calling us to some sort of uh, sicko masochism, that, that we're supposed to somehow enjoy pain. But the reason that we are to rejoice in suffering is not because we're supposed to enjoy pain but because our hope that God is producing something in us through the pain is of so much greater value and greater eternal significance than a temporal life free of pain. Now, God is transforming us through our pain into a people who are marked by perseverance and character, which is then why when we experience this pain, we're not to despair. We're not to wonder where God is. So he's saying, another in the fire, we can say to ourselves, we don't just sing this on Sunday, we say to ourselves, God is with us in our pain. God is with us in our suffering, promising to use that pain, promising to use that suffering for his glory and our good. And folks, when we finally get that, when we finally get that, maybe we get that here, but it's got to travel 18 inches down here. When we finally get that here and here, it will revolutionize the way we understand and respond to our pain. I had lunch a a while back ago with a guy celebrating six months of sobriety after years of battling drug addiction, and he shared with me that one of the catalysts for him getting clean was his realization that emotional pain was not an enemy that he needed to numb. It was this realization that his emotional pain was not an enemy that he needed to numb. What he shared with me on that point in that conversation at lunch was so profound that I was thinking about it all day. And then later that evening, I texted him and I asked him to write out what he had shared with me because it was obviously something that he had thought a lot about because he was very succinct in the way he said it. So I said, hey, would you text me that? And so he did. Here's the text. He said, for most of my life, I numbed my pain. I worked diligently to not feel things. But no matter how hard I tried to be free from sadness and pain, it nevertheless was there. I tried to find a reprieve with drugs, but it was only temporary, as is every means of instant gratification. And the drugs only compounded the long-term misery. But now, he says, I've come to realize the benefit of experiencing all my emotions. It is when I face unpleasant feelings, 
and work through them in prayer that my faith muscles grow stronger. I will never again choose to numb myself from the pain that God has allowed to be part of my life. His will, not mine. My will has led to dark and dead in places. My will and my attempts to numb my pain have only made my life more of a mess. Never again, he says, numb no more. Numb no more. Friends, the reason that we can rejoice in our pain as Christians is because of what Paul says here, the hope of glory. Because God is using our pain to transform us into a people marked by perseverance. And because God is working through our pain to fit us for the glory that he's preparing for us, he's doing both of these things at the same time. He's transforming us into a people who are marked by perseverance. That's happening right now. And he's working through that pain to fit us That's happening right now for the glory he's preparing for us in the future. And the basis for this hope and future glory, folks, is not some sentimental, let's try to make ourselves feel okay in the midst of our suffering, Pollyanna, wishful thinking. All right, this is not a Jedi mind trick. No, our hope, the basis of our hope, is built on the rock solid foundation of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Again, what we were just declaring in song a few minutes ago. It's not wishful thinking. It's not a Jedi mind trick. Our hope is built on the bedrock foundation of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. This is what Paul's referencing in verses 9 and 10 when he says this, Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Life here is a reference to Jesus' resurrection, his new life, which is the first fruits and the down payment for our new life that's coming. In other words, Paul is saying that Jesus' resurrection is proof that God will make good on his promise of a glorious future, a new life in the kingdom to come, what Paul calls salvation. And this hope that we have in that glorious future salvation, Paul says, it won't disappoint us. It will not disappoint us, he says in verse 5. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. It's not going to disappoint us. Unfortunately, many of us are still putting our hope in things that will disappoint us. Money, success, security, health, friendship, people's approval, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse, that next vacation, that next achievement, that next toy, that next pleasure. And again, I want to be clear. These things are good things. But when we put our hope in good things to fix us, fill us, or fulfill us, we're turning good gifts into false gods. False gods that will not ever fix us, fill us, or fulfill us. Because these things aren't strong enough to bear the weight of our hope. If I put all of my hope on the mariners, like every, just, I mean, I know it's humorous, but like, just imagine if I was just betting everything the satisfaction and fulfillment of my life on the mariners, the despair that I would feel. (laughs) Now, that's a laughable one because you know the mariners are terrible. But you do this. I do this with other things. I've got to have this in order to really be happy. I've got to get my circumstances orchestrated this way in order to really be fulfilled. You do this. I do this. We, we, We do this. It's not that these things are in of themselves bad. It's that these things won't fix, fill, or fulfill us. And when we put our hope in those things, they crumble because they can't bear the weight of our hope. But when we put our hope in the one who's fitting us for the glorious future he's preparing for us, God will also grow in us the assurance along the way that the pain that we're experiencing, the suffering that we're enduring right now, that it won't go for not. It will be fully redeemed. It will ultimately be restored. When? In God's coming kingdom. This is why we sing that song, Joy to the World. We're going to sing it, I hope, in a couple of months, maybe. It's why, you know, we get to that verse in Joy to the World. There's this great verse that says, no more let sin and sorrow grow, no thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. Far as the curse is 
found. Far as the curse is found. Jesus will make his blessings flow to every area of your life and mine that's been touched and tainted by the curse. Far as the curse is found. As far as the curse is found. Jesus' blessings will flow as far as the curse is found. Now, if that still sounds like ethereal and like sort of philosophical, let me try to be personal and practical. What does it mean that Jesus' blessings will flow far as the curse is found? What does it mean to have hope in the reality that Jesus' blessings will flow as far as the curse is found? Here's what it means practically. Here's what it means personally. It means every place in your life where you've experienced pain. It means every place in your life where you've experienced disappointment. It means every place in your life where you've experienced some kind of loss. Every place in your life where you've wondered where God is. Or why things aren't working out like you'd hoped. It means every place in your life that's been touched and tainted by the effects of the curse, Jesus' blessings will flow even to that place in your life that you're thinking about right now. Even to that place in your life you're thinking about right now. It means that when Jesus brings you into his glorious kingdom, he will replace whatever you've lost, restore whatever's been broken, and revive whatever's died. That's a lot better than sitting on a cloud for eternity strumming a harp. Jesus' blessings will flow to every place in your life that's been touched and tainted by the curse, replacing whatever you've lost, restoring whatever's been broken, and reviving whatever has died. This is why D.A. Carson says, I am not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. That's pretty good. Maybe put that on your bathroom mirror. Say that to yourself in the morning. Preach that to yourself when you're going through hardship. I'm not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. You hear the difference? This is not to say the suffering that you're going through, it's not that big of a deal. Or to do some, again, Jedi mind trick where you're like, actually, it's not painful. No, it's painful. I don't know all your stories. There's a lot of new people. I don't even know all your names. But I know some of you. And as I look out on some of your faces, I know you're going through some hard stuff. This is not a Jedi mind trick. This is not, it's not that hard. No, this is what you're going through is hard. What you're going through is suffering. But in the context of that, you can say, I'm not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. That's our hope. That's our hope. That's gospel hope. It's not Pollyanna hope. It's not wishful thinking hope. It's gospel hope. Gospel hope means that we can rest assured that wherever our stories are still marked by sadness, wherever our stories are still marked by suffering, there is a day coming for all those who put their trust in Jesus when our stories will be set to rights. When every aspect of our lives that's been touched and tainted by the curse of sin will be redeemed and restored. Spoiler alert, folks, Jesus wins. And if we've been justified through Jesus, Paul says in verse 1, we win too. That's what the next 10 verses are all about. If we've been justified by Jesus, verse 1, then we win too. And that's what Paul's doing in the next 10 verses. He's just telling us about the spoils of victory that are ours. Jesus' victory over sin at the cross was won for us. In the past, peace with God. He obtained Victory for us at the cross, peace with God. Jesus' resurrection and ascension means he is right now at the hand of God, reigning in heaven, interceding for us, so that we, in the present, have access to God for his help. Present tense reality. And at some point in the future, Jesus will usher us into his glorious kingdom, which will be the fulfillment of our hope of glory. Past, present, future. These three benefits of our justification, peace with God, access to his grace, the hope of glory, they all correspond to the past, present, and future tenses of our salvation. In other words, Jesus' victory covers every dimension of time. In the past, he achieved peace with God for us. In the present, we have access to his help right now. And in the future, the hope of glory. And Paul says in verse 5 that the reason we can know this future hope that it won't disappoint us, is because he says this, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. 
In other words, according to verse 5, one of the Holy Spirit's primary purposes in the believer's life is to pour out God's love into our hearts. Now, question, what does it mean exactly for the Spirit to pour out God's love into our hearts? Does that mean that the Spirit gives us warm fuzzies? Does that mean the Spirit gives us goosebumps? Does that mean that the Spirit gives us spiritual shivers? Well, I'm going to be clear on this point. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit can't give us physical manifestations of his love like these that I've just mentioned. I'm just saying that's not what Paul's talking about here. In fact, just for the record, the Bible nowhere talks about God's love in terms of warm fuzzies, goosebumps, or spiritual shivers. Rather, Paul explains that the way the Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts is by directing us back to the cross, by reminding us of the reality the historical reality of what God did to prove his love for us. What God did to prove his love for us. Listen to what Paul says right after referencing the Holy Spirit pouring his love into our hearts. Next verse, verse 6. You see, he says, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. Now, here's the logic of what Paul is saying. Paul is saying it's rare that someone would choose to sacrifice their life for someone else, right? I mean, they might do it for a good person. They might do it for someone that they deem is worth dying for, like a parent dying for their child. But listen to what Paul says next in verse 8. But, transition word, but in contrast to what I've just said, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, the proof of God's love for us is the cross. That he died for us. That he died for us while we were still sinners. While we were still his enemies. While we were still doing our own thing and going our own way. J.D. Greer says, God laying his life down for us is not like me laying down my life for my kids. I was God's enemy. That means God laying down his life for me is like me laying down my life for someone who murdered my kids. Imagine if someone murdered my children and was being sentenced to execution and I showed up at the trial and offered to take his place so he could go home and start a new life. Who would do that? God did that. Taking our place and taking our punishment at the cross. That's how much he loves us. Friends, the cross is the proof of God's love. And I say that in order to make this next statement. I wish I could make eye contact with every one of you. The next time your feelings are causing you to question God's love, look to the cross. Read Romans 5. Don't just listen to your feelings. Tell your feelings to read Romans 5. Don't just listen to your feelings. Tell your feelings to read Romans 5. Friends, God wants you to know that he loves you. And the cross is the proof of his love. That he was willing to do for us what we could not and what we would not do for ourselves. God also wants us to know that we can have peace with him through the cross. Because the more you know that you have peace with God, the more you'll take advantage of the access to his grace that he's made available to you. Even on those days when you feel unworthy. Even on those days when you know your spiritual resume is in shambles. Because you've got Christ's resume. And then the more you take advantage of the access to his grace that he's made available to you, the more that you will grow in hope that God will use even the pain in your life to transform you into Christ's image and to fit you for the future he's preparing for you. Which leads me to three simple questions and three simple next steps. First question is this. Do you have peace with God? Do you have peace with God? Do you know God loves you? Do you know that God has accepted you? If not, then receive peace with God today by putting your faith in Jesus as Savior and King. Again, I'm not asking you how you feel about God. I'm not even asking you how you feel about God when you're in church. I'm asking you, do you have peace with God? Do you know God loves you and has accepted you? If not, receive peace with God today by putting your faith in Jesus as Savior and King. Receive justification. That's that big word, justification. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. 
which happens when we put our trust in him and we receive his resume so that God now sees Christ when he looks at me. Number two, do your feelings of unworthiness or a lack of sensing God's love keep you from approaching God for his help? Do your feelings of unworthiness or a lack of feeling God's love, does that keep you from approaching God for his help? If so, then maybe your next step is to tell your feelings to listen to God's word and to start boldly accessing the grace of God that has been made available to you through Christ despite whatever you're feeling. Despite whatever you're feeling. In fact, I would say it this way. This week when you feel especially unworthy or this week when you feel especially distant from God, when you don't feel God's presence, let those feelings, instead of moving you to discouragement and wondering where God is, let those feelings be a trigger to take Romans 5, 2 to heart and to access the grace of God that's been available to you now through Christ. That's your next step. Start boldly accessing the grace of God, despite whatever you might be feeling. And then finally, number three, is there an area of life where you're discouraged or disappointed? If so, I want to encourage you to name it. Not ignore it. Not act like it's not painful. Not do a spiritual Jedi trick to somehow get it out of your mind's eye. No, name it. What area in your life are you experiencing discouragement or disappointment? Name it. And then this week, maybe this morning, maybe multiple times this next week, ask God to renew your hope, to open your eyes, to see him working even through that pain, to ask him to open your eyes, to see him fitting you now for the future he's preparing for you. Let that disappointment, let that discouragement be a trigger for asking God to renew your hope, to open your eyes, to see the pain that you're going through as something that God is going to use to fit you for the future he's preparing for you. So however God might be speaking to you today, I just invite you to respond to him and then receive from him all of the glorious benefits that are ours through the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for all that you've done for us in and through Christ. Thank you for your great love that you didn't wait for us to begin cleaning up our act. We certainly couldn't ever clean up our act, but you didn't even wait for us to begin cleaning up our act. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray by your spirit, bring these truths to bear in the hearts of those who are gathered here today. Do that work in me. Do that work in us so that we understand more and more and more all that you've done for us and the incredible benefits that are derived from that good news of the gospel. Even now, minister to us these truths and then help us to respond so that we become more and more a people who are marked by the good news of the gospel and live our lives with that hope. Only you can do this, Lord. And so we call out to you to do it. In Jesus' name, and everyone agreed and said,